were not quite prepared for this kind of a welcome. I was asked to come and talk about family business. That itself was complicated because <clears throat> I spent some time thinking about it, what shall I speak, and I got confused. I passed on the confusion to gentlemen who were with me in the morning. I still, because I believe <clears throat> I can speak on both sides for some time. So today, uh, The old adage, you know, to keep it simple. I'll first trace, I, I, I don't know how much time I have, but uh, if I overstep, please give me a shout. <coughs> Let us go to the very beginning. <coughs> hundred years ago, automobiles were being made, manufactured. First entrepreneur was Henry Ford. <coughs> Dodge Brothers produced a car called the Dodge. General Motors came on the scene, and soon, by the 1920s, vehicles were being churned out. By that time, Lindbergh had crossed the Atlantic. 1927, airline became an airline industry came into being. Commercial airlines came into being. Somewhere along this line, <clears throat> people realized that management was not an art. And management is a science. It is a science just as physics, chemistry are called sciences. And therefore, you can teach it, you can draw out principles of management which will be true at all times. And so the management schools were encouraged. Alfred Sloan, the head of General Motors, was one of the first. That's why we have the Sloan School of Management today. The, and academics from, you know, emphasizing on medicine, engineering, different types of medicine, the sciences, etc., also s started to teach management business. This is the origin, this is how it started. And then it grew because industry was growing. But all of it was related to manufacture, provision of services of some kind or other. And uh, the two world wars contributed in bringing management into sharp focus. Logistics became important, cost of transportation became important. This was an era of change, that, of rapid progress that took place. 1910 or 1911, the Wright brothers flew a few hundred yards. By 1935, 36, 30, and then 20 years, 25 years later, America, Germany, England, Japan, all these countries had fighter planes. I mean, technology, I mean, they were, every day there was an improvement taking place. Practical improvement which had an effect on how the world shaped also. <coughs> if you take the 20s, 30s, 40s, in all these countries, they were in all these businesses were founding families. Ford Motor Company had Ford family. Every other business, whether it was automobile related, it was chemical, or otherwise, had somebody who started it. He was the one who was the entrepreneur who went forward and said, that, "Okay, I'll, I'll do this chemical." And uh, 20, 30 years later, they came up across the problem because the entrepreneur was there most of the time. It is only when succession had to be thought about 
then the concept of who leads, somebody from my family, somebody born to me, or somebody who was good otherwise. So this dichotomy, this change started to come about, I think in the 50s, 40s, 50s, and later on. At the same time, all these companies had, did not live within the shores of their country. They expanded, they traveled outside, they became global. And globalization brought in its weight also brilliance in terms of management and also exposure to different countries, etc. So globalization had an effect on these companies, whether how they coped with it. Did they cope with it? History records that by the 70s, 60s, 70s, etc., going forward. If a company had to grow, then the family control had to loosen. Because if you needed capital, you needed capital from investors. Investors came with their whole bag of tricks and accountability, which not necessarily could be uh, provided by the family or a family member, etc. So expertise started to become important. And we saw a gradual shift. As companies wanted to grow, you see, when Ford bought a company for a long time, Henry Ford, a descendant, was running the company. Then at some point in time, they settled for three seats on the board or four seats on the board, and things changed. David Rockefeller was the president, was the chairman of Chase Manhattan Bank. Rockefeller family, now nobody. So these there are some changes <coughs> which are inevitable. That we call it change, we call it progress, however you define it. All of it is related to size. As you grow, as you want to big, as you want to get bigger and bigger and bigger, then the small family which started it cannot hang on to management, automatic right to management forever. And that is what history has shown. The then came, take even India. In India, a lot of businesses were family business. Family business meant, I wanted to know what is the definition of family business. The Credit Suisse report says, in a public company, if somebody controls more than 20 percent, it's family business. I don't agree, but okay, we'll take that for the moment. The uh, India was full of licensing from the start. License Raj was held, held the uh, center stage. So a lot of family business came about. The people, whoever got a license, could set up a factory. It would be successful because demand supply was matched, etc. But at the same time, in the 90s, when we ran out of money, we started the reform process and we let in foreign capital and we opened the doors to foreign competition. Many of these businesses folded up, but they were not able to withstand and stand up to true competition. So many of those people who had been successful who had a bus stop full of licenses and many of them bit the dust. Reason? They did not see change happening. They did not, I mean it's like, who moved my cheese? They did not realize what had happened. Their, their, their business model was taken away from them. They didn't know it was going till it gone. So the, that was another phase as far as India is concerned from the early 90s to now. So much change has happened. We are literally, you can say that we are international. That is, doing business in India doesn't mean you're doing business in India. You're doing business here just as you can do business elsewhere. Maybe a few more regulations. But otherwise, the concept of licensing to start a business has gone, which was the predominant one, which is what held sway in the beginning. So therefore, the uh, erstwhile 
family run businesses took a big hit because if they had possibly been given time, they could have uh, survived. But all this happened too fast. Before you knew what is happening, people had come in next door was a foreign company producing the same product as you. He had access to capital. Your money cost you a lot of money, maybe 10%, 12%. How can you fight with a fellow who draws money in 1% or 2%? Impossible. So these were the challenges that Indian industry faced. So some succeeded somehow, innovated. They were naturally brilliant also. Therefore, they withstood. Others were not quite able to. So today we have a mixed bag. We have foreign companies, Indian companies, all coexisting in, in every sphere, every space. So in a sense, today we are global. So it is in this context, in this backdrop, that we must look at family business. You have to also superimpose upon this the effect of the technological revolution, information technology, where India has done well. A lot of entrepreneurs have come up, a lot of new companies have come up who are competing with the rest of the world. But there is a contradiction there, you know, when you talk of family business. In an industry where technology is prominent today, Technology doesn't last 5 years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, no. Somewhere along the line it's gone replaced by something. So where's the concept of a family? So I would, in a business if I'm there, if my offspring has to also be part of it, by looking at a longevity of 20 years, that does not exist in today's technology. So therefore, the, the, there you have startup entrepreneurs, you have entrepreneurs who develop products, who develop processes, all of which are successful, but I don't think they will last the test of time, 20, 30, 40 years. Maybe very, some may, very few may, mostly they will not. So they will be, they, they will grow and be replaced during their own lifetime. So therefore, when we talk of family, we talk of family businesses, we have to really talk about the old smokestack industries which are still there, to which this may apply, to also the new CTD. Business does not mean manufacture. The business means trading also. It means providing services. So, and also, for example, take the a guy with a small textile mill, textile business, he does garments. He's contributing to the economy, he's exporting, is successful, is doing, but to him, yes, important for, for how to run a family business is important. Particularly if he has more than one child, he has two, three children, but how does he manage, how does he? So far what they have done is, in many cases, they have themselves innovated. Either they have grown bigger, divided the business, or tried to find one or two allied products for somebody to do, but that is a I won't call it a problem area, but that is an area to be to be addressed as we go forward. The, when you come to the, some of the larger companies, public companies, etc., then you have to seriously examine the. We have examples of successes by family-run businesses. We have examples of spectacular failures by them also. Look at it, one thing is clear, I mean it is my own personal experience is that uh, in any business, focus. If you don't have the time to focus on your business, invariably it will not do well. Second, consistency. I cannot have shifting thoughts every day on how to do business. I cannot. I, third, some principles. You have to adhere to some principles. You see, this is, this is the most important thing. See, a person will deal with you if he knows that you are fair, you are consistent. No one denies the other man a profit. 
while doing business. That is not at all a problem. But are you straight? Are you true? Do you mean what you say? I think all these become very, very important, particularly you see, even the large businesses in India, company, international standards, they are not that big. They are so small. So you must, if you want to develop them into global businesses, then the company must have a character. What is the character of this company? I think that, that is a defining statement which whoever is at the helm is responsible for. See, the, invariably, I mean, you can have success, a license has produced a lot of success, etc. But today, how many are successful? You know, the, uh, there is one other aspect also. You, some may agree, some may disagree. There is a story of uh, Napoleon Bonaparte. His chief of staff and others were urging him to make a certain person a, a general in his army and to lead a certain campaign. He listened to everybody and said, okay, he is good, he is brilliant, everything, but tell me, is he lucky? So Napoleon Bonaparte also said, everything is good, but is he lucky? So ultimately, that is one aspect which is not in our hands. Am I lucky or am I not lucky? I don't know. Time will tell. But at the same time, what he meant was, how is this decision making? That is really what he was asking. Is this decision making consistent? That, that, that is, I think, what he meant. So we have, if you look at history, management First, management appeared on the scene, grew, it developed, companies became global, new technology came, and now every day we are, we, we are hit by newer and newer technology. In the midst of all this, we have this discussion here on, on, on family business. My own experience, what is my own experience after all? I think that is one way of... My own experience, I think, uh, epitomizes all that is good and bad in a family business. My father died early, I, I was... I'm an engineer by the way, so... I was studying, I completed engineering, I came back here. I got into this firm, because at that time, the height of family business culture here, I was 23 years old. Then there was a, there were intrinsic differences between me and my father's partner. I belonged to a different generation, uh, thinking he was different. So ultimately, long and short of it was I found myself out in no time. And at that time, I had to scratch my head and say, what am I going to do? Here is supposed to be your family business in which you are involved, exited, but you are out. I decided that, no, I will, I'll give it a shot, I will not. So it took me eight years of struggle to finally get back inside. When I got back inside, the same people who threw me out also were there. I took one decision at that time. I said that uh, focus on the business, not what has happened. That was the first decision. I think that's a good decision. The, as a result of which, from 89 onwards, I just focused on India cement, its growth, management, etc. And the company grew. If I had wasted time on Acrimony, looking at the past, nothing would have happened. I think that's one very important lesson. In any family business, there are times that there will be conflicts. But you must know how far and how much you can put time, energy or thought into that conflict. 
When I came back, if I had carried over, if I had taken all the vestiges of the past, nothing would have happened. We would have continued to fight. But the day I got, I made one decision, I shall not, I just forget. I act as if nothing happened. And that, I think, was one of the reasons why I could go forward. Good progress. We grew. At the same time, then, we grew with debt. The second lesson I learned, I mean, all these are, is you can, see, growth is available. In every industry, in every business that you have, you can grow. Opportunities will be there. But debt is a very fierce antagonist. You cannot. So if you go just past that, you know, it's very tempting. Friendly bankers will give you money. Only, I mean, only to further their business. Let us, you know, he is doing his business, he is not doing anything wrong. But the first sign something wrong, he will run away. He, he will disappear. But that's also his job. I don't find fault with him. He's not critical of him. He at least is doing his job properly. So we got into a problem, we expanded, suddenly found the debt level was such, everybody was on ahead. We somehow survived by getting into corporate debt. The restructuring came in and came out like this, gave us a little breather. In a couple of years, we were out. But it taught me a very important lesson. It taught me an important lesson. Ambition is good, growth is good, but not on debt. You must have your debt levels under control. As we are finding today, open the newspaper today, every day you find. 1 lakh crores, 40,000 crores, 50,000 crores. Everybody or anybody who has debt above a certain level is sinking, is bound to sink. The same people, five years ago, they were the, the, the people were singing their praise. The same newspapers. But today, they dump on them. So, Praise is very, uh, is false. Honestly, I have found it, it's quite false. Because it gives you an exaggerated idea of yourself, which may not be true, and the slightest problem, they, your uh, feet are pulled under. So a lot of people have found what I learned long ago, that debt is not easy to carry. Third thing is, which I again realize. And what I talked to is my own plus minus. One mistake, a good point, I did not dwell on the past. Mistake, expand on that. Another common feature of India's family businesses is unrelated diversification. The first, the great temptation is to go do his business because he's or his business because he appears to be doing well. I go in flounder. I lose capital. I lose money. If I'm lucky enough, if my balance sheet is big enough, is strong enough, I can take the hit. But I would have caused that hit. A professional would not do it. A professional would weigh 100 times before he goes away from the knitting. Whereas a family entrepreneur, to him, oh, so what, I will go in this. You can go to the club in the evening and say, I'm in this business also. That is actual danger. So many companies have got into such problems, all because of unrelated diversification. This, I, th I think this is, a, uh, this is one area where one should be very, very careful. Long ago, at a general meeting of Toyota Motor Corporation. They had a lot of reserves. They had uh, here was the last. So much of money, why don't we diversify? Why don't you do something else? The chairman of Toyota answered, because I did not do that, this money is there. <laughs> so, see, this is the most important thing is you accumulate reserves. You accumulate money in the bank because you are good at what you are doing. I think this, you know, there are two things which are very important, you know, whether you are, it applies to your family business, otherwise, it is good to be ambitious. But there is another word 
word called contentment that also must be there. See, I cannot become Tata Jayadi Miller, Tata Overlay. I cannot. I, must, I can grow. I must be happy with what I get. Achieve. Set goals. Nothing wrong in setting goals. But don't try to go to the moon. That is not possible. Many a company has fallen down because they tried to outrace themselves. They, they went past their capacity. Peter principle applies to companies also. So, this unrelated diversification, this attempt to become larger than life, these are problems that have to be avoided. Because if you get into that syndrome, it's very difficult for anyone to say you. Particularly, it is so tempting, and I'm doing this, I can do it as similar, all, all that is right. I say that flows better because of doing that. Then we must understand when we want to grow, want to grow, you need capital. Equity is costlier than debt. You will find you in business school, Great Lakes your professors will teach you the, in detail what I mean. Debt is costly, it is difficult, but equity is more deadly. As they will explain to you in your, in your classes, you will understand and learn. So if you want to grow, you have to go touch equity. When you touch equity, then you're not playing with fire. You must understand a new and different set of responsibilities and accountabilities come and sit next to you. It is good. It's all, it's not, these are not bad. It's good for you as the company. Earlier, when, before we had did a GDR, before we had taken any international money, we just, once a year we presented a balance sheet, we told the board every month or two months, or now every quarter I have to answer. Every quarter, analysts are online with the results, 100 people, each one of them tracking your company. All of them asking you very pertinent and deep questions. So, a, you must know your business thoroughly. You cannot anymore be general in your replies into the, to this community. You have to be precise. You, you have to answer every little thing they ask. So accountability start, starts. And every day you are, you know, something, somebody may say something, he may say something, you are asked. You must have patience. You must learn patience. You cannot say, who is he? All those days are gone. He can ask anything he wants. He doesn't have to wait for a shareholders meeting. He can ask that they say, this is reported in the press that the price of cement has gone down. What is your view? If it has, say yes. Otherwise, say no. Tell the truth. Do not try to bluff. That's the first thing. That's an important thing you must learn. I'm talking, I'm a family, not business. I am talking of my experiences and also advice to those of you who, will, who want to grow. Be straight. Never be afraid of two things. Never be afraid to ask if you don't know something. Never be afraid to tell the truth. This is very, very important. Never pretend. Why should I pretend to know something when I don't? I'll say, excuse me, you tell me what it is, define it. I am confident enough of my own intelligence to be able to understand something once explained to me. But I am not the repository of all knowledge in the world. So why should I pretend to be? I think that that, that is extremely important to an entrepreneur, to all of you who will develop in businesses and grow those businesses. This is an advice I, I, I give you. When I, when I tell you, this is an old story, but this is true. I went uh, to the U.S. in 1965. I had maximum gone on uh, to Bombay and Delhi to play tennis, but uh, what did I know? The rest of the world, nothing. So I landed in the U.S. I had written a letter to post. No, no cell phones, no nothing. I had to write a letter to my mother that I had reached America. So I had this post. You know, we are used to this British type of post boxes. No, you put the envelope inside. So I was first time seeing the American post box. I walked around the town and scratching my head. 
Then an American came. He said, son, what are you trying to do? He said, I want to post a letter. He then he pulled the yeah, said open and then he said, oh. but I was not afraid to say, I don't know how to post a letter. I'm sitting in front of a post box. That is the first lesson I teach, I, I tell all of you, never be afraid to ask. What is wrong? I don't know, I don't know. I didn't know you had to yank that handle and the thing opens and a huge big thing to drop that. I've never seen a post box like that before. So the important point is, never be afraid to ask. Nobody is going to make fun of your ignorance. Because there are hundred things he doesn't know, which you may know. So therefore, let us, let us not at all be shy. The then again, in, in our story, we, we came out of Syria, we grew, we expanded. Again, there was a problem with the mind. <coughs> but this time, unlike last time, experience had taught me. So I said, okay, let us sit across the table, what is it? Finally, I bought him out. But the experience of the past, I set aside all ego. No ego, no nothing. This is the pure business. You don't like something, you feel you have a better opportunity, you will get a price, okay, name your price and settle it. Ego did not come at, in at all. I did not say you are supposed to be my partner, you are supposed to be there, you should have given me first offer, nothing. So I think that is very important. It's a very important learning is when dealing with your partners, throw the ego out. You want something to succeed, I mean, but one thing, if you continue to fight, you will 100% go down the tube. You have to find a way to amicably settle differences between partners. I think this is very, very, very important in a family run business. Because the more time you spend only looking at the family, you are taking your mind away from the business. And I, and I think that that, that is uh, criminal, if you ask me. Because you are given an opportunity. You both are sitting together. You are running a good company. Business is doing well. Both of you fight. That is stupid. You have to find some way. I mean, how? I mean, it is easier said than done. But in my life, I have done it. I have lost out, lost time because there was a conflict. I saved time because I settled. See, these are in, in the same thing even with my brother. So ultimately, you cannot, there is no family business that can afford a fight. There is no family business that can afford a partner's fight, a family fight. It will go down. So this is, some, this is a lesson from my own life that I tell you that uh, it is better to spot this out earlier Deal with it. I mean, I think that 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 I think that is very very important. And finally, again, I tell you this, the example of the super king. Mr. Pawar was the president of the BCCI. I was the treasurer. Sitting in a room in Bombay, talking about the IPL, etc. They're going out, they're going to auction a franchise. I asked a question that if supposing this model works, then the franchise owner will have greater influence in a state association than the members of the association themselves. <coughs> Mr. Binda, two, three people said, oh, for us nothing will happen. I said, no, for me it will. I, I feel it is different. So what do you want? So I said, I can <coughs> India Cement has received a letter from Mr. Bori inviting us also to bid. Can I bid? Mr. Power said, well, I'll tell you. Then he wrote me a letter saying, I've consulted everybody, nothing wrong, there's no conflict, you can bid. That is how India Cement bid. Later on, the courts made a meal out of it because the same Mr. Power and gang went and complained that I had Conflict of interest. No, you only told me to bid. Okay, why did I bid? What was the reason? One, we are a cricket company. Two, 
if for example nobody bid sufficiently high chennai would not have a franchise i think cricket chennai is very strong in cricket so i felt that people of chennai must have an opportunity to have a team of their own finally they agree the rest is history we have we are lucky to get ms dhoni and the csk has done very well and again we, we every people got jealous in the very first ipl a wrong decision we lost the final this time also a wrong empiring decision we lost the final anyway we how you take it is with equanimity okay it hurt at that time but it happens in cricket my last thought i want to leave with all of you is that ultimately there is one the world has changed it is not the same do not say they don't teach in business school the same thing they taught me when i went to business school time has changed a lot tremendously but uh, while looking while growing your business by looking at remember one thing ultimately it doesn't matter if it is a family run business or a non family run business the business must succeed that is i that is the thought i will leave with you ultimately what is the use of saying it for my family business but i am down the train too no all this is fine it can be family it can be non family professions can do it but find the solution that makes your business good you are, you are capable all of you are capable this is why you are sitting here so that is the thought i leave with you is ultimately the business must succeed thank you